What is the gospel? They say it's good news. But why? It seems as though it is simply a list of do's and don'ts, and we keep beating ourselves up for not being able to obey them all. No, the gospel can't be law. The gospel has to do with death, but the death of sin, so that we can truly live. The gospel isn't a one-time thing. It is a journey, a journey through every area of life, a journey through our ups and downs, a journey through trials and triumphs, a journey to the Father's kingdom, a journey that needs to be rediscovered. your Bibles with me today and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever you have, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That was Philip Brady who sang that beautiful song for us just a few moments ago. And um, aren't you glad that Jesus is all you need? I trust that, um, that, that you really feel that way. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be preaching a sermon that, that, that simply is titled, Jesus is enough. And at times we say that he's enough, but I'm not sure that's a reality in our lives, and we're going to be talking about that in just a a few weeks. So let me ask you a question this morning. How does God feel about you right now? This very moment, how does God feel about you? Is he happy with you? Think about that. Is Is he mad at you? Is he, is he upset with you today? What, what does God think about you? If you're like I was for many years, your answer may depend upon the kind of week that you've had. For example, if you were consistent in your Bible reading this week, if you didn't get too mad at your wife, If you didn't lose your temper and you controlled your tongue, this week no four-letter words came out of your mouth. If, If you had a pretty good spiritual week, you might sit back and say, nah, today I feel pretty close to God. And I'm pretty confident that God has a good feeling about me. On the other hand, though, let's say that you didn't do a good job this week at being a Christian. This week you gave in to some temptations. You didn't want to, but you gave in to some temptations. You were a jerk to your wife this week. Let's admit it, sometimes there's weeks that we're jerks to our wife, right? You were a jerk to your wife this week. You you were too busy. This is one of those busy weeks. You were so busy that you didn't pick up your Bible hardly at all all week long. And when you watched the Dolphins game this past Sunday, you yelled some choice words at the television set because you were probably as frustrated as I was when you watched the game. So if you had one of those type of weeks, then maybe you came to church today thinking, boy, God's not happy with me today. God God is pretty disappointed with me. He might even be mad at me this morning. For, for years in my Christian life, I kind of struggled with that. If I did well, I thought God would give me, you know, that, that celestial thumbs up. If I had a rough week and I just didn't act, I didn't perform the way that I knew I was supposed to perform, I could imagine God up in heaven loving me, but up in heaven just going, not a good week, Brian. Not too happy with you this week. Well, what if I told you this morning that the way God sees you, the way God sees me, has nothing to do with my actions, good or bad, this week. And the way God sees you has nothing to do with your actions, good or bad or bad this week. You see, here's the simple truth that I want us to catch, and this is a, an extremely profound truth 
this morning that I want us to catch. The way God sees you this morning has nothing to do with you. Now, now don't misinterpret that. That doesn't mean that we have license to say, Woo-hoo! that means I can go out and do anything I want. I can live the way I want. No, no, that's not the truth. And actually, we're going to see that in next week's message. But the way God sees you, the way God sees me this morning, has nothing to do with my goodness, my badness, my faithfulness, my unfaithfulness, my ability to be or not be a Christian. The way that God sees me this morning, the way that God sees you, has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the gospel. That's what Paul is talking about in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. So we're in Ephesians chapter 5. Let me encourage you, if you have your phone, your iPad, your Bible, follow along. We'll put the verses up on the screen. We're going to begin reading in verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16, Paul says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. You're familiar with verse 17, and we're going to study it next Sunday. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. If you have a pen and you, you mark in your Bibles, I would underline that word reconciled. You're going to see it many times in the passage. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry, once again, of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here's the text I really want us to see today. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Would you pray with me today? Lord, today's message deals with an extremely profound truth. Lord, one that is difficult for our finite minds to grasp, difficult for us to understand. Lord, I pray today that the Holy Spirit of God would enlighten us. I pray that he would be our teacher. Help us to understand the truth of what Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Help us to accept this truth, to embrace this truth, to rejoice in this truth this morning. Help us to realize that in Jesus Christ, we are accepted. Lord, thank you so much for the magnitude of that truth. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. And we're going to be studying, as I mentioned, this passage for the next two Sundays. Uh, We're not going to study it in chronological order. Today we're going to look at the latter part of the passage, and next Sunday we're going to go back and look at verses 16 and specifically verse 17. Here's the premise of today's message. Sometimes we don't tell you the premise and you've got to figure it out. Here's the premise of today's message. It's in your notes. It's on the screen. I want you to catch it. Here's the main idea. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is changed, it's restored, if you will, because God exchanged your sins for his righteousness. So so your position as a Christian, my position as a Christian, my acceptance as a child of God is secure. My life is changed. It's transformed. Not because of what I do on a regular basis, but it's because of what Jesus Christ has already done for me. That exchange that took place where Jesus took my sins upon himself and he gave me his righteousness. What a profound truth. Understanding that ought to make us stand up and shout 
Feel free to do that if you want to, but, but, uh, but um, boy, nothing like a preacher baiting the congregation, huh? I'm telling you, though, seriously, this is one of the greatest. This is one of the most profound, life-shaking, life-transforming truths of the gospel. So I want us to flesh that out. You say, Brian, you've already told us the main point. Why don't we just pray and go home? All right? No, I want to flesh that out this morning. Because I want you to completely understand the truth and the reality of the gospel. So, so the first thing that, I, that we need to notice is this. Your relationship with God was broken because of your sin. And I need to say the same thing. It's not just you. My relationship with God was broken because of my sin. Now, your broken relationship, my broken relationship is not seen in the passage, but it's clearly understood. You see, in order for something to need fixing, it must be what? Broken. You don't have to fix anything that's not broken. You don't have to reconcile anything that is already joined together. You reconcile something that is what? That is separated. You fix something that is broken. So even though Paul doesn't talk about our broken relationship in this passage, he certainly insinuates it. He insinuates that your relationship with God is broken because of your sin. And my relationship with God is broken because of my sin. Man's relationship with God was severed by Adam and Eve's sin. And your relationship with God is severed by your sin. Sometimes I think we minimize sin. If we could ever grasp the magnitude of our sins. You see, sin has caused a myriad of problems. Let me just mention three problems that is caused by not only Adam and Eve's sin, because it's easy for us to throw them under the bus and blame them, but, but here are problems that are caused by my sin and by your sin. The first is this, if you're following in your notes, sin caused a physical separation from God. You remember there, clear back in the Garden of Eden, that God placed Adam and Eve in this garden, this beautiful, perfect paradise of a garden that not only was, was a paradise, not only was it beautiful, but God was there. And God walked in their midst. And all of a sudden, you know what happened. Adam and Eve were tempted, and, and they gave in to their sin. As a result of that, they were what? They were expelled from the Garden of Eden. They were expelled from God's presence. Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man to the east of the Garden of Eden and placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Man was created to live in God's presence. But what did sin do? Sin caused a separation. Sin caused a physical separation from God. Here's the second thing we need to understand. Sin caused a spiritual separation from God. I love the words of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2. Notice these, the, this verse with me. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. There we go. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. See the personal pronouns that are there? He's not saying, but Israel's sins have separated them from God. Or your country's sins have separated them from God. But he says what? But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins, my sins, have hidden his face from us so that he does not hear. You see, sin causes a physical separation from God. It also causes a spiritual separation from God. And we could take that one step further. Sin caused a, an eternal separation from God. 
You know, Romans chapter three, or excuse me, six and verse 23. Paul says, for the wages of sin is death. What, the payment for our sins is what? It's death. It is eternal separation from God. So, so when Paul talks about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this idea of reconciliation, we might sit back and say, okay, I get it. Is it really important? It's extremely important. Be- because my sins, however many they are, have separated me from a holy, righteous God. I have no chance, no hope whatsoever of restoring that relationship on my own. And you don't either. Our sins have broken our relationship with God. Your relationship with God was broken because of your sin. Man, if we ended there, that'd be a pretty discouraging message, would it not? If I said, okay, amen, go home, fix it on your own, we'd be in trouble. But the message doesn't end there. Notice the second thing. Your relationship with God is reconciled through Jesus Christ. Christ. Your relationship with God is restored. It is made new through Jesus Christ. As I mentioned before, the word reconciliation is found five times in verses 18 through 20. The word reconciliation comes from a Greek family of words that that convey the idea of changing or exchanging. It fits so well in this passage. This word, this Greek word, was originally used for the changing of money, the exchanging of coins, and now it has come to this idea of reconciliation. And so the idea being that reconciliation involves a change in relationship between God and us. Previously, our relationship with him was broken. But now it has been what? Reconciled. Now it has been restored. Notice verse 19 once again. It says that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. This world that was broken, this world that was filled with sin, this world that had separated itself from God, God sends Jesus Christ with the ministry of reconciliation to take God's creation that is broken and ruined by sin and reconcile that to God once again. And so your relationship, my relationship with God is restored, is reconciled through Jesus Christ. So here's what I want us to see today. How did that reconciliation take place? How did Brian, you know, this wicked guy named Brian, this sinful guy named Brian, how did Brian go from being completely separated, completely disconnected, completely condemned by God to all of a sudden today, Brian is back in God's favor. And you are back in God's favor. How did that take place? That's what the Apostle Paul talks about in the passage. So notice if you're following along in the outline, here's what Paul says. Paul says reconciliation is possible because God's wrath towards your sin was appeased, here's a big word, or propitiated by Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. It's a mouthful. Reconciliation is possible because God's wrath towards your sin and my sin was appeased or propitiated by Jesus Christ. Propitiation is a theological term that has the idea of the satisfaction or the appeasement of wrath. Let me, let me take a few moments and illustrate what I'm talking about today, all right? I've been waiting for this opportunity because every time Dr. Hill speaks, he throws me under the bus every single time. And so I've been looking for the perfect passage to throw him under the bus, all right? And so today we're doing it. A couple weeks ago on a Sunday morning, he and Priscilla came in, and, and Priscilla, his wife, runs right up to me and says, Pastor Brian, Pastor Brian, we have a serious problem. And I'm like... Oh my word, do we need to set up a counseling session? What's going on? She said, there's a serious problem in our marriage. And every time I hear that, it's like, oh my word, what's going on? And so, I mean, she's saying it right down front here, and I'm like, okay, tell me, what's the serious problem? She said, Pastor Brian, Mike stole my secret stash of cookies. 
Now, for anybody that doesn't know, they've already announced that Priscilla is expecting again with another child. And so, you, you know that an expectant wife has what? Has certain cravings, has certain things that they want to eat. And so, um, pregnant wives have a tendency to stash things all around the house. Mark, our son, if you noticed on Facebook this last week, he said, boy, April and I have been dieting all week long. I thought she was doing well until one day April said, I have a confession to make. And she took him all around the house and she sewed where she had stashed cookies and she had stashed candy and stashed all of that. So evidently Priscilla was doing that and Mike got into her secret stash. Not only got into her secret stash, but from the way I heard the story, ate all of the cookies. So that when Priscilla went for cookies, there was what? There were no cookies there. So she comes in on Sunday morning and she's what? She's pretty ticked off, all right? She's pretty ticked off. She's mad. She's upset. Why? The cookies are gone. So what did Mike have to do? And I still I haven't heard the rest of the story, but if I know Mike, Mike realized, okay, there's something that I have to do to appease or satisfy that wrath of my wife. And so I would say that Mike went up to her and bought her all the cookies that she wanted or her special kind of cookies, or he promised her, I'm not going to touch your stash. You're not touching her stash anymore, are you, Mike? Okay, all right, learning that lesson. So whatever Mike did for her, whether it was he bought her a dozen cookies, he went to the bakery, bought her her favorite cookies, whatever it was, that gift that he gave her to appease her wrath was what? It was a propitiatory sacrifice. It was a propitiation. It satisfied the anger of Priscilla. Now, she's not here today, so I don't know whether he maybe stole the cookies again last night, and maybe he needs to buy another one. No, I'm sure that's not the case. All right, so here's the idea. The idea is this, that my sins, however many they are, and your sins, however many they are, angered a holy, just, righteous God. And God in his righteousness demonstrated righteous indignation, righteous wrath towards our sin. But when Jesus Christ came and lived the perfect life and died on the cross, his death was not only vicarious, it was not only substitutionary and the fact that it took our place, but his death became the propitiation for our sins. So when the Bible talks about Jesus being the propitiation for our sins, it addresses the fact that Jesus' death on the cross completely satisfied the wrath of God towards your sin and mine. Let me show you two verses that are in 1 John. I love these verses. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. Notice what John said. 1 John 2.2. 2. Do we have it, guys? I think we might be having some problems with the PowerPoint. Let me read it. 1 John 2, 2. I'm not sure they're going to put it up there. It says this. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what's the idea? Yes, my sins angered God, but Jesus completely satisfied the wrath of God. He was that propitiatory, say that three times really fast, propitiatory sacrifice that satisfied the wrath of God. First John chapter 4 and verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So, so, so here's what I want you to catch today. Reconciliation with God is possible, not because you sit back and say, okay, God, Boy Scouts honor, I'm never going to commit that sin again. Not because you turn over a new leaf, not because you decide to be a Christian. You are reconciled with God. Why? Because Jesus paid the price for all of your sins. And the wrath of God, the righteous wrath of God was appeased, it was satisfied by the death of Jesus Christ. You and I can never pay that price. I could never live long enough. I could never be righteous enough to pay that price. 
But the good news is I don't have to. And you don't either because Jesus already did it for me. Reconciliation is possible because God's wrath towards your sin was appeased or propitiated by Jesus. Let me show you a second thing that we see in the passage. Reconciliation is possible because your sins were credited to Jesus. Your sins were credited to Jesus. There are actually two aspects of our sins being credited to Jesus, and I want you to see it in the passage. The first is this, if you're following along in the outline. Because of God's mercy, your sins are not counted against you. I want you to see this verse. Look in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 19, Paul says this, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. The word, the word accounting there in the passage is a banking term. It's, a, it's an accounting term. Some of us, sometimes we have this idea of God. God's up in heaven with this divine calculator, all right? And every time we sin, he adds another one to it. And if your life's like mine, man, he's punching that calculator like crazy. Slow down, Brian. One plus one plus one plus one plus one. And so we have this view of God that here's God up in heaven, and he is counting our sins. Every time I sin, every time you sin, God knows it, and he adds it to your ledger. As if, oh my word, Brian, there is sin number 2,300,045 or whatever. But notice, Paul says that's not what's taking place. When Jesus reconciled us to himself, the world to himself, how did he do that? Not counting our trespasses against us. And so your sins are not credited to your account. My sins are not credited to my account because of God's mercy and Jesus' death on the cross. Your sins are not counted against you. As I mentioned, no one is up in heaven with a sin calculator, counting and adding up all of our sins. That doesn't happen. Why? Because your sins aren't charged to your accounts. Your sins are charged to Jesus' accounts. Every time I sin, it's not placed in Brian's sin account. Every time I sin, Jesus sits back and says, put that on my bill. Put that on my tab. I've already paid the price for Brian's sin. I have already paid the price for your sin. And by the way, our sins weren't just written off either. It's not like God saying, ah, you know what, no big deal. I'm a generous God. I'll just forgive you of all of your sins. No, they weren't just written off. They were charged to Jesus Christ. Notice verse 21. Paul said this in verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Let me change the wording because sometimes we see those pronouns and it doesn't make sense to us. Here's what he's saying. For our sake, God the Father made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. So God the Father takes the perfect life of Jesus Christ who never sinned, never lied, never demonstrated unrighteous anger, never had an unkind thought, never blew up at anybody, no curse words ever came out of his mouth. He never kicked the dog unjustly. He always took the trash out on time. Here's Jesus who lived a perfect life. Zero sins in his account. And God the Father says, I'm going to take all of Brian's sins and I'm going to transfer them over to the account of Jesus Christ. God the Father made Jesus to be my sin, even though he didn't know any sin. Because of, G- because of God's mercy, your sins are not counted against you. Notice the second aspect. Because of God's grace, Jesus 
became the sacrifice for your sins. Notice verse 21 once again. For our sake he made him to be sin. A lot of theological debate over what does that mean, he made him to be sin. Did Jesus become a sinner? Did all of a sudden the perfect son of God become a sinner? Did did Jesus actually become the physical manifestation of sin? What does that mean? I believe that it means that Jesus became the sin offering. He, He became, as we mentioned, that sacrifice for sin. The role of Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins is clearly seen over and over again in the Old Testament. This isn't in your notes, but let me give you a couple of these and you can go back and study them later on and think through some of those great Old Testament stories. You see, Jesus becoming my sin is just like the ram that was sacrificed in the place of Isaac. Remember the story? Remember the story? God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, you know that one and only son I gave you, Isaac? Oh, yeah. God, man, Isaac, he, he's like the apple of my eye. I don't know whether I've thanked you today, God, but thank you for giving me my son, Isaac. Well, here's the deal, Abraham. I want you to take Isaac to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him there. What are you talking about, God? He... He's the son that you gave me. He is my only son. Yeah, I know, Abraham. I want you to take that only son that I gave you, and I want you to take him, and I want you to sacrifice him there. Abraham obediently obeys God, loads up the donkey, travels with his son to the top of that mount. What a great story in Genesis chapter 22, and you can read it. Little Isaac looks at Dad and says, Dad, we we have the altar and we have the wood. But, but where's the sacrifice? Abraham looks at his son and says, Isaac, God will provide a sacrifice. A few moments later, he binds up Isaac, lays him on the altar as God commanded him to do, takes a knife, raises it, is about to obey God and do the unthinkable. When God says, hold on, stop, stop. I was just testing your love and your loyalty to me. And in verse 13, it says, Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behind him a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. You see, Jesus in my life and in your life is just like the ram who was sacrificed in the place of Isaac. We come to the book of Exodus and Israel is in bondage there in Egypt, and God desires to redeem his people from from the oppression of Pharaoh. And, And you know the story, God sends all these plagues upon Pharaoh, and Pharaoh refuses, and he doesn't want to let God's people go, and all of a sudden that last plague God commands the Israelites, I want you to take a lamb without spot and blemish. I want you to take this Passover lamb, and I want you to kill the Passover lamb, and I want you to spread it over the doorposts, and the blood will cover and protect your household. You see, Jesus is just like that Passover lamb. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ Our Passover also has been sacrificed. Jesus is just like the ram of atonement and the scapegoat of Leviticus chapter 16. This is a great story that I'd encourage you, if you've never read, I know the book of Leviticus is a little bit difficult to read, but go home and read Leviticus chapter 16 because Leviticus chapter 16 presents this great story of how, of how the sins of Israel were, were, were paid for and, and forgotten. And so basically, here's the idea. God tells the priest to take two animals, a ram and a scapegoat. And the first ram, they cast lots. The first lamb was was chosen to pay the price. It was the atonement. That lamb was killed and its blood was shed on the altar covering the sins of the children of Israel. And then they were to take another 
another ram or goat. If you have the King James or an older translation, it, it, it pronounces it or it describes it as a scapegoat. But basically what would happen is that, is that animal would come and, and the priest would lay hands on that animal and symbolically the sins of Israel were transferred to that scapegoat. And then that scapegoat was taken out into the wilderness and it was, it was let loose, it was freed to never return again. I never really understood that. I did a lot of reading on that because I sat back and thought, well, that's kind of weird. That, uh, that scapegoat represents all of our sins and that it doesn't die. It, it continues to live. Does that make sense? And, uh, and I began to read about the Jewish tradition and the idea they said is that the person that took that scapegoat out into the wilderness would not just release it, but many times it would place it on a ledge, a ledge in which if that animal fell, it would fall off into the rocky cliffs below. And that animal would not only live, but that animal would die die there in the wilderness. But here's the idea that is illustrated by the ram of atonement and by the scapegoat. The idea is this. It represents Jesus Christ who fully paid the price for our sins and it represents that our sins are not only paid for, but they are forgotten by God to never be remembered again. And God will never accuse us of them again. Man, what a, what a great truth. Because of God's grace, Jesus became the sacrifice for our sins, completely paying the price. And God promises to never accuse us of those sins again. What a, what a deep truth. You see, as our sin offering, Jesus shed his blood as a payment for our sins. As the scapegoat, Jesus took our sins, carrying them from us and freeing us from the guilt and the bondage of sin. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many. Catch me, I know this is a little bit of a deep study, but reconciliation with God your relationship with God was broken, but God desires to reconcile, to restore that relationship. It's possible because your sins have been credited to Jesus. And at that point, we'd say, amen. amen. Oh, or, or let me coach you, all right? At that point, we'd say, amen. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't give you enough of an indication there. We could end the service and say, wow, what a fantastic truth. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus already paid the price for our sins. Wonderful truth. But that's not all. Sounds like an infomercial, does it not? You get this, and you get this, and you get this. And you sit back thinking, wow, what a great deal. But that's not all. You get more. So here's what God says, not only is reconciliation possible because your sins were credited to Jesus Christ, but catch this part, reconciliation is possible because Jesus' righteousness is credited to you. Not only are your sins credited to Jesus, but Jesus' righteousness is credited to to you. Verse 21, he says, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you see the exchange that's taking place? Theologians have called this the great exchange or the divine paradox because the idea is that Jesus takes something of us that is completely worthless and in exchange, he gives us something of immeasurable worth. I, I meant to, I have to apologize, I had this illustration that I was going to use today and we spent the day yesterday at the hospital and I wasn't able to, but imagine today that I had a brand new crisp $100 bill. And I said, here's the deal, I'm going to give this crisp $100 bill to anybody who has $100 of Monopoly money. Does anybody carry Monopoly money in your wallet? Why don't you carry Monopoly money in your wallet? Worthless. It's worthless. I mean, you can't go to Wendy's after church and say, I'd like a number two. Hey, you know what? Here's $100 of Monopoly money. Keep the change. It, you, you can't do it. Why? It's completely worthless. 
It's not worth anything. So if I looked at you and said, I'm going to give you $100, real dollars, and you give me $100 of Monopoly money, you'll say, deal, I'll take it, because you are getting something of great worth in exchange for something that is what? Worthless. So here's the divine exchange. God says, here's the deal. Give me your sins, and I will give you my righteousness. You give me something that is worthless, and I, in exchange, will give you something of immeasurable worth. You see, here's what's taking place. Our sin was poured into Jesus at his crucifixion, and his righteousness is poured into us at our conversion. Let me flesh that out for just a moment. The exchange of righteousness is possible because of Jesus' perfect life. All right, it's not like I'm saying, okay, hey, Mike, I'm going to give you my righteousness for your righteousness, all right? Mike's righteousness is not worth anything. My righteousness is not worth anything. The exchange is only possible because of what? Because of the fact that Jesus lived a perfect life life. That's what verse 21 says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. The one who had never sinned has perfect righteousness to offer to us. Hebrews 7 26, for it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Peter describes Jesus this way, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. His perfect life is the basis for his gift of righteousness to you and to me. Paul says it this way in Romans 5, 19, for through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Even through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. So so we're able to receive this gift righteousness of Jesus Christ because of his perfect life. I want you to catch this last point, though. This exchange of righteousness is possible because of your union with Jesus Christ. You see, the moment that you by faith responded to him, you were united with him. Let me illustrate. I think, is Vicki here? Vicki, are you here? Are you behind me? Come on out here. Doesn't she look pretty to be a grandmother? I'm telling you. Look absolutely beautiful to be a grandmother. 32 years ago, we were married. 32 years ago, we became one. It's been a great ride. Amen. Has it, Vic? Yeah. It's been a great ride. I'm a great husband, aren't I? You are. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes you got to ask for the compliments in front of everybody just to get them. All right, so, so here's the deal. We've become one. My weaknesses are her weaknesses. Her strengths are my strengths. Guys, you see the way I did that? My weaknesses, her strengths, all right? All right. When I look bad... It casts a negative reflection on her. When she looks good, and boy, does she look good, right? Huh? When she looks good, it makes me look good. Why is that? We're one. We're one. So catch this. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, or better yet, you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You became one with him. Here's the way Paul says it in Galatians 3.27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, you have united yourself with Christ, all right? Have clothed yourself with Christ. We're united with Christ. So here's what I want you to catch. Today, let's 
Let's suppose Vicky's Christ, all right? Today, when God sees Brian, when a holy, righteous God looks down from heaven and he sees Brian's life, he doesn't see the fact that I've blown it this week. He doesn't see the fact that I haven't been as faithful in my scripture reading as I should. He doesn't seem to see the fact that I've probably been a jerk once or twice this week that I shouldn't have been. He doesn't see my unrighteousness. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. And so every moment of the day, every moment of the day, I am clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Every moment of the day, you are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's not an excuse to sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, Paul says that. That's not at all. But I do not have to sit back and say, oh my word, God's disappointed with me today. Oh my word, I've blown it. Today, I am clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when God looks at me, when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. Catch it. He sees Jesus. The great exchange. Not because of anything that you've done. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he took your sin and he gave you his righteousness. And as a result, the sinful guy is reconciled to a holy, righteous God. Our reconciliation is possible not because of us, but because of Jesus. Thank you, Vicki. Let me show you one last thing, and I'm done. I'm done. Your relationship with God should result in you telling your story to others. He says that in the passage. Notice, notice in verse 19, he says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us, what? The ministry of reconciliation, entrusting to us this, this word, this ministry of reconciliation. In verse 20, he says, you are ambassadors for Christ. Who is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who represents someone else. He says, you are an ambassador for Christ. You are a living testimony to the fact that you were a sinner. You were separated from God. Your relationship with God is broken. But because of Jesus, your life has been restored. Because of Jesus, you are now in fellowship with God. Because of Jesus, you're now a son of God, an heir of God, a joint heir of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give you the ministry of reconciliation. I want you to go out and tell others what God has done to you. And sadly, we get this great message of reconciliation that we what? We keep to ourselves. We don't share with others. The greatest exchange in the history of the world. And we keep it to ourselves. Paul said, you are an ambassador for Christ. Let the world know that you are reconciled to God. Isn't that a great truth? So, how does God view you this morning? As God looks on you at this very moment, how does God view you? Well, if you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have responded to him, if you've surrendered to him, if you realize that he is your hope, he's your all, and you have responded to him by faith, when God sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus, the great exchange. Now, on the flip side, there's never been a moment in your life when you've realized that you were a sinner and you responded with a broken heart to your sin and asked forgiveness of your sin and responded to Jesus, when God sees you, guess who he sees? You. And he sees your sin. The bottom line is what? We need Jesus. What Philip spoke about. He's our answer. 